<laughs> I absolutely love the steak background. Are you using that for all your podcasts now? Uh, you know, I just I, I put it up a little while ago and I haven't taken it down yet. It's a pretty good background. I'd say it's making me hungry. I haven't had breakfast yet. It's like five, it's 6 a.m. here. I was up. I got around 4.30 after doing some stuff, did a little bit of workout. And uh, anyway, you know, I'm busy these days. So I, I saw you were up that early. I was like, oh, my goodness. It must be like 3 or 4 there. Yeah, I woke up around 3. I thought like 3.30 I woke up. And then I was like by about 4.30, I was like, all right, let's get moving and stuff. And so I had some stuff to do this morning with uh, – anyway. So Is that your uh, everyday – is that your everyday morning for you? It's lately has been, you know, since obviously, you know, we just launched this company and we're, uh, you know, we're, uh, yeah, my book came out and, and so it's been pretty busy. I got this, a lot of, a lot of stuff going my way and just trying to manage it all and still, still, uh, you know, have a, have a family life and stuff I got to do it earlier. So anyway. Well, I'm so glad to have you back on Fast Keto. It's been a couple of years since I actually had you on the show the first time. I know most of our listeners and watchers already um, hit the record button just now so we can get started. But I know that since you were first on, you were one of the very first carnivore MDs and doctors that I had on the show. And I, I'd love to know what you think of everything that you've created you know, congratulations on your new book. I'm so thrilled and excited for you. Uh, we have the same publisher. I know the feeling of like getting your hands on the book the first time and like what a dream come true that is. So what are your thoughts on like everything that has happened in the last couple of years? It's been pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty it's pretty fun to, you know, to have been on the ground floor and watch it, watch this sort of sort of ch change in a paradigm shift a little bit. And there's a lot of people embrace it. Um, obviously, as you know, I mean, we've just got thousands and thousands of people that have, have, have really improved their health significantly when nothing else has worked by adopting a, you know, kind of a meat-based diet. And I think that's just been wonderful. It's what gets me, you know, it's what gets me up in the morning. I mean, I, I mean, every day I wake up to some success story and I'm, I'm sure you experience the same and it, it's really, really fun. Uh, it's really, you know, of all the things I've done in my life from a career wise, and I've had a lot of different jobs and, and career type of things this has been the absolute most fun i've had uh it's 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 you know it's challenging there's a lot of challenges ahead but it's also very uh it, it's just i'm just inspired every day by other people and it's been a blast and it's it's cool to see where you know three years ago when i started doing this and obviously i wasn't the first guy to do it but when i started doing it, i, I was kind of one of the more i guess I got more in the public's eye, uh, you know, as people were saying, man, you're crazy, it's stupid. And now we're seeing, you know, there's still a lot of people who think that, but we're seeing a significant shift and people are saying, hey, maybe it's not so crazy, maybe it's not so stupid. Maybe um, there's a lot of people that can benefit from this. And, and that's what's really captivates me. I'm not in it to, you know, this is a diet to get ripped or lean or, you know, that I'm just like, man, there's people that are really, really hurting out there that are, I mean, they are, I mean, at their wit's ends, or I mean, they're they're literally living in misery, and we're seeing that go away, and that's that's all I really care about at the end of the day. You're so right, and I know I love Meat Heels. I've been reading that for a couple of years now, and some of the stories on there that people share, you know, about digestive pain, and like they're hor horrific. I some of them just bring me to tears, and then to have someone see relief from that, I know that's why you probably became a doctor was to help people. And so I, I'm, I'm not surprised that you're so excited. You can barely sleep just from getting these stories from people. You're actually able to heal people and help them in such huge, massive ways. And you're absolutely right. So people have been doing zero carb for a long time. A lot of it was kind of relegated to these little esoteric online forums where people are doing ZC and zero carb, but you really put carnivore on the map, like by coining that term, going on Joe Rogan, you know, doing all this stuff. Um, so I'm so happy and excited for you that you're coming out with this book now. And I know we're going to talk more about the book a little bit more towards the end, what people can expect from it. Um, and I know you're also launching a brand new site and stuff. So I'm really excited to talk about that. I want to know what your face looked like when you saw the New York Times saying that red meat maybe won't kill you and maybe they were all wrong about all the bad advice given about red meat. Well, I mean, certainly it was no surprise to me. And I had kind of got a hint that something like this would be happening. I talked to Nina Teicholz ah. about uh, six months ago. She said there's going to be a couple of major studies coming out that are going to wow. kind of 
question the narrative. And, and so when you look at the authors of that study, and it's very interesting, I mean, this is a very interesting thing and most people know this. So this came out from the Nutrix Consortium and the chairman of the Nutrix Consortium is a fellow named Gordon Guyatt. Gordon Guyatt is in the Canadian Hall of Fame as a professor of evidence-based medicine. He is the guy that actually coined the term evidence-based medicine. He is a guy that has been for 30 years pushing for high quality evidence. I mean, this is where it all comes from. This is where all this evidence-based practice in medicine comes from. Gordon Gott is a man, and he was the chairman of that committee on that study. And he basically says, after looking at all the evidence and reviewing it critically and holding it up to higher standards, you know, we don't have any good evidence that shows that red meat causes cancer. We don't have any evidence to show any good evidence that shows that red meat causes heart disease or anything else. And so for a guy whose whole entire career, in fact, I'm going to interview him on my podcast nice. in, in a couple of weeks, he, he is like the guy, the king of evidence. And he's saying there's no evidence. So this is, this is significant. People don't understand the significance of this sort of thing. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, as you saw the response from, you know, guys like Neil Bernard and the, the PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, the, it's kind of a PETA, PETA advocacy group is trying to sue to put in, to have the Federal Trade Commission to put an injunction to retract the study. I mean, people don't want to hear something that doesn't com comport with their bias. And, and I mean, it's, it's just amazing to see the pushback against, you know, we're trying to say, hey, let's, this is important stuff. Let's use a high level of evidence. First of all, I mean, just, just from a, a sort of a common sense, evolutionary plausibility perspective, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense for red meat to be harmful to us. Um, I mean, we've been eating it for, gosh, eons. And, and, and you know, I make this argument that, you know, every animal in the wild that eats meat does not get chronic disease. I mean, why would humans, who have been animals who had, had eaten red meat for three million years, why would we now suddenly get disease from that? And others, some people say, well, the modern meat production may be doing that. I think there's some, I don't think that's a very particularly strong argument. But, um, yeah, so I was, I was obviously pleased to see that. It gives more credence to what I do. Uh, you know, we're going to be doing a study on carnivore dieters, it's going to be done with uh, David Ludwig out of Harvard. Uh, it's going to be a big, big study. It's going to get in a major journal. It'll, it'll, you know, it'll probably be sometime early next year, I think, by the time it's published. So we're going to continue to see more and more research that's going to support what yes. I'm promoting and doing. And again, I've never been some of this dogmatic that you have to do it this, you have to be a strict carnivore. I'm just saying that I think this is what I have behind me is great nutrition, and I think if you eat a lot of it, some people. Some people do best eating nothing but that. But if you eat a lot of that and you don't eat a bunch of junk food, man, your, your health is going to be good. Yeah. And I love, I was going to, that was my next question for you. It's going to be, you know, how are things going with the, the study on the study front? Uh, so that's really good to hear because the more science we have coming out, the more research we have coming out. I'm participating in the carnivore deuterium study that Dr. Paul Saladino is doing. I'm not sure if you saw what he's doing on that. Uh, so any studies that we can participate in, you know, as carnivores, I think it's just helpful to put out that science. So I was just at the low carb universe conference in Mallorca. There were two presentations there that you would have loved. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen Dr. Ann Childers. She does a talk called stone age body space age diet. And she shows, she shows, shows so much archeological evidence you know, how our bodies are designed to eat meat. And uh, Craig Emmerich did a great talk there, The Case for Carnivore. And he talked about how our stomach pH is so acidic that, you know, we can digest anything. We're basically scavengers. Uh, and also it's very hard for us to actually digest all this fiber. So seeing more science coming out about it, more people talking about it, you know, it really gives us the data and facts to be able to combat all this misinformation, all the bad facts out there. One of the things we were talking about a lot at the conference was the bioavailability scores of meat versus plant foods. So we have some great charts. A few of us have posted out there showing comparison of the micronutrients in you know, beef, beef liver, chicken liver compared to plant foods. The one thing I think that's really missing is we don't really have we have biological value, but we don't actually have a scoring system for how bioavailable that food is. Uh, so that would be something I think that would be really neat to see come out at some point. I'm not sure if you know anyone doing any work on that, but it would be really helpful. 
Yeah, I mean, there's something called, you know, there, when we're talking about protein availability and bioavailability and quality, I mean, there's something called, there was, there was something we used to use called PDCAS, which is protein digestibility amino acid score, or calculated amino acid score. And now they've upgraded something called the DIAS, which is a digestibility, digestibility of indispensable amino acids score, I think. And that takes into account some of these things, the, the, the bioavailability, the absorption of capacity of us for obtaining uh, nutrition and, and high quality uh, amino acids from you know different sources, and we consistently see animal proteins way up top. Whereas you know most of the plant proteins are very low on that scale, and the only one that even kind of gets up there is basically soy is probably the best source of plant protein. You know as far as that, but soy has you know certainly some concerns with soy. There's you know uh, protease inhibitors, and, and and some people are concerned about phytoestrogens, and some of the other compounds are in soy that. Uh, may may be de deleterious for some people so there are so there are some some measures out there that look at that quality bio bioavailability so that's not completely unknown uh, but clearly um you know animals win pretty much hands yeah. down well i just think the science is so important for us to have especially in the face of movies like the game changers getting messages about that every single day. I had pretty much convinced my brother to become carnivore. And then he saw this movie and he's like, I don't know what to think anymore. I'm like, you know what to think. It's, it's, this, it's all in the science. So I've been pointing a lot of people to uh, the work that Brian Sanders is doing. And I love that Dr. Jamie Seaman was doing these uh, blood tests and showing, you know, that they're just lying in the movie. So uh, I love all the stuff and posts that you've been doing about that. But what do you say to people when they when you get that fateful message? Probably, I'm sure you get it at least uh, once a day from someone saying, like, "What do you think of the Game Changers movie?" You know, I did a fifty I did a fifty one minute review of the Game Changer video oh, awesome. on, on my YouTube channel, and I went through pretty awesome. much every single scene and said, "This is why this is inappropriate. This is why it's misleading." Um, you know, I mean. You know, and Chris Kresser was just on Rogan's show yesterday talking about it. And Chris called me uh, a couple weeks ago to discuss this and say, hey, what do you think about Game Changers? Tell me what, what your thoughts are on the athletes. And we, we talked for about half an hour. So it was good to see that he used a lot of my sort awesome. of uh, stuff on, on, on Joe's show. But, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a very, you know, I mean, James Cameron was behind. He's obviously a very accomplished filmmaker. So it was very much – propaganda, high production value, appeal to emotion, appeal to cherry, you know, using cherry pick data, using misrepresentation of the science. I mean, it's just the same old, same old thing. It's, it's an advocacy film. It's not a scientific film. Right. Um, yes, it will convert some people to veganism. And yes, those people will find out very quickly that veganism doesn't work. I think the most important, the, the most impressive thing I've seen is the athletes that do this. And, and as an athlete, you really stress your system and you really stress your nutritional strategy. And what we see by and large athletes adopting, you know, particularly any high level athletes adopting a vegan diet over a period of any length of time, almost always invariably see injuries and performance drop. And they may see a short term lift because they got out, you know, they stopped going to McDonald's and eating French fries and Cokes and they clean up their diet and they focus on, they focus on their diet and they're more mindful about it. And, you know, maybe they're, 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 they're working on their macronutrient ratios and they improve a little bit, and then you know, six months to eighteen months, two years later, boom, they drop. And all, and if you follow up all the athletes in the film, and I did, I said, well, this film was shot in twenty seventeen, you know, or some of it was from earlier footage. But mm -hmm. you look at the guys, particularly guys in the NFL, and you see almost every one of them is hurt, retired, done, not playing anymore, cut from their team. Um, so veganism is not. And that's, it's certainly not the best strategy for an athlete. It, you know, it's not that some athletes can't make it work to some degree, but they always will be limiting their ultimate capacity, I, I think. I mean, I think that's pretty clear. Um, I don't think there's anybody out there that is the best they could possibly be on a vegan diet uh, for almost any sport. There may be a rare exception, but I mean, I think for the most part, like we talked about, you know, this is one thing, I, you know, Tom Brady is a, you know, I don't know if you know, Tom, Tom Brady's a famous football quarterback. He's won yes. you know, a bunch of Super Bowls and everybody's saying he's plant-based, he's plant-based. But when you look at Tom Brady's diet, 20% of his diet is coming from fish, red meat, and eggs. 
that is more than the average American. He's actually eating more meat, more eggs, and more fish than the average American does. The difference is instead of the rest of the diet being Oreo cookies and, and Doritos, he's eating, you know, natural, whole, process, unprocessed food and, and, and as plant material, but he's still eating a lot more meat than the average American. He's not eating dairy. And this is a misconception we have is that the American diet is a plant-based diet already. It's 70 plus percent plant food. Now, most of it is junk. Most of it is refined grain, sugar, seed oil, uh, soy, soybean oil, stuff like that. But it's still mostly plant-based. We eat very, very little meat in the United States. I mean, even though we eat more than other countries, yeah. um, the average American only eats about 2.4 ounces of, of beef a day, which is, a, you know, it's a wow. tiny amount. Two ounces wow. is nothing. And we're, we're trying to say, hey, red meat is the blame for this and that. I'm like, you know, why don't we look at the 80, 80% or the 90% of what else we're eating? You know, it's just, it's just kind of crazy the way we, we, we kind of sort of demonize this thing. It is. And it's very strange as well, you know, to see correlations being made between eating beef and the destruction of the Amazon rainforest. And, you know, when we look at the contribution of beef and what it does to our overall environment, it's very, very small, right? So, yeah, I mean, this is a, a very nuanced discussion and I, I've had those discussions and I've got, you know, it's so you know, we, you know, first of all, you have to look where you live individually. So I live in the United States. Um, the, the meat I eat does not cause any rainforest deforestation. I mean, that's just a myth. I mean, there's almost none of our meat in the United States come, even comes from Brazil. It was actually banned for several years. And now it's only like 0.5% of the meat in the United States comes from Brazil. Cattle in the U.S. Pr produce 1.9% of our greenhouse gases. Tiny, tiny amount compared to transportation, 28%. You know, industry, electricity, energy, that's all about 80% of our greenhouse gas. So it's a tiny amount. The water numbers that they, they quote about all the water we're using, all of that with almost a tiny percentage, except it's a tiny percentage, is rainwater. That rainwater that goes into producing cows falls regardless. The cows eat the grass, which takes up some of the water. Cows then urinate, they defecate, they respirate out, you know, that all goes back into the water cycle. These water numbers, again, are in, inflated. It's not that animal agriculture is harmless and we shouldn't continue to work to improve it, but it's not the, 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 the it's not that 800 pound gorilla that's destroying the plant. Now, when we talk about the Amazon, um, some of the Amazon forest has been deforested uh, due to soybean production, uh, and that is probably one of the larger drivers of deforestation. However, the overall rates of deforestation in the Amazon have declined significantly since they peaked about 20 years ago. But when we talk about soybean production, what is what is the financial impetus to grow soy? Well, the most lucrative part of the soybean is the soybean oil, and so that is why that crop is being planted. Um, and, and Soybean oil goes to human beings. Cows don't eat soybean oil. No animals eat soybean oil for the most part. Um, so that is first being reason why soybean is, oil, is being grown. But if soy was not grown in that forest, they would grow something else. They would grow coffee. They would grow sugar, sugar cane. A lot of the sugar cane is planted in Brazil, has displaced the cattle off the, 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 the grasslands to plant sugar cane. So they've moved the cattle around. So it's more complicated than you think it is. Mm -hmm. And then when they talk about all the, the soy is going to feed the animals, that's not true at all. They're not feeding cattle. Cattle cannot eat soy in any significant quantity. It makes them sick. They can have a small amount as a protein ration, but the majority of the soy, again, it goes to oil first for humans, and then the leftover materials, the soy meal, uh, is then fed to other animals, mostly like pigs in China. This is where it's coming from. It's not the, it's not the cattle in Brazil um, that's, that's, that's driving that deforestation in the soybean crop plant. Um, it's, 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 you know, Soybean oil for human consumption, firstly, because that's the most profitable part, and then the leftover is being fed to, to the pigs in China. But regardless, people in the Amazon would be deforesting no matter what. If you got rid of cattle, they were deforest for another reason. So it's not it's not the cattle they're doing. It's just that is what they they currently you know they currently like soybeans because it's more lucrative. Um, so it's it, and again that's a local policy, and it's not right. like I said it's not happening in the United States. I mean, the, the, the Congo is being destroyed, the forest, and it completely has nothing to do with cattle. I mean, it's one of the biggest forests in the world. Uh, Indonesia, the, the palm oil production is deforesting that. You know, and this is not livestock type stuff. So there's, you know, this is, these are all regional issues that have to have a regional solution. And, you know, me not eating meat 
in the United States or you not eating it in, in the Czech Republic is not going to have an impact significantly on that at all. And it's, you know, like I said, if, if we weren't cutting down the trees for soy, and again, remember, we cut down the trees for wood, first of all, you know, they're, they're using that to build furniture and homes and stuff like that. So it's not like they're just throwing the trees away. I mean, they're, they're right. doing their, there's many things that go into that. There's mining, there's uh, coffee plantations, you know, the acai berries are all planted in the rainforest. And there's a lot of evidence that that is causing a biodiversity loss. So it, it's, it's more nuanced and more complicated than that. Um, you know, the fires that, were, that happened this year, um, that was the fire rates that happened this year were lower than average, but they were just higher than last year. So they're like, oh, it's 80% more than last year. Well, last year was a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. They had a really low year. It went up 80% this year, but it's still lower than their average over, over the last 30 or 40 years. And so, again, it's all overblown uh, stuff that, that, that the people like to cling on to to say, hey, hey, the, the world is burning down. We, we've got to stop eating meat right away. You know, and then the other discussion is, and I, and I go into a lot of this stuff in the book, right? Yeah. People that are sick, the healthcare industry in the United States produces 10% of our greenhouse gases. And what I'm seeing with people that go on a carnivore diet, and I know you've, you've obviously seen some of the results that I've seen, people are getting healthy. They're getting out of the healthcare industry. They're getting out of the healthcare sector. So that sector is driving 10% of our greenhouse gases and cows are driving 2%. Well, last thing I checked, 10 is bigger than two. So if you're no longer you know, chugging down diabetes meds and hypertension meds and hypertension meds uh, and no longer having to use the ER and, and that stuff, you are improving the health of the environment. So, I mean, I think, and I've said this before, the most healthy diet, uh, the most environmentally sustainable diet is the one that doesn't create sick people. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And it's such a huge burden, healthcare is such a huge burden on, on the country as a whole. So, to have people be healthier is just going to benefit our society so much. One of the biggest things that, you know, I see you talk a lot about is vegan nutrition versus carnivore. And, you know, it seems like a lot of people who go on both of those experience results. I think the correlation being because they're getting off of these ultra processed, hyper addictive foods. And it seems to me that that is really being pushed by profit because a lot of the tobacco companies, I heard this on Brian Sanders' uh, podcast that he did recently, he had someone on about food addiction. A lot of the tobacco companies went into the food companies, you know, when they kind of knew that time was up for them and they created this addiction model in foods and they created very addictive, hyper-processed foods. And it's amazing to see so many people getting benefits, you know, from going off of those foods. And I think carnivore, it's one of the best ways of doing it, obviously, because you you get off of those foods, but then you also enhance your body composition, your health by having such nutrient dense foods in there as well. And it's it's really amazing to see so many people getting healthy. And um, I'm so excited for your book because I know it's gonna it's gonna impact so many more lives. And the work that you're doing has just been absolutely amazing. Now, switch, switching gears a little bit, what is in your mug this morning? I want to know. Do you drink coffee? I want to know a little bit about what your morning routine is like. Yeah, so my mug is is is, is water. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I've never been a coffee drinker. I just never liked okay. it. So I mean, I I've had like one and a half cups of coffee in my life. I mean, my first cup I had when I was a 14 year old kid. I was working at a restaurant as a dishwasher, and I had to get there at like four o'clock in the morning. And as a 14 year old kid, you know, you're kind of dragging butt. And I remember one day the 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 cook came in and he was like, man, you look tired, dude, have some of this. And I think it was coffee from like the day before. And I was like, Oh my God. This is awful. <laughs> so I never liked it, you know, and I tried it once later. And I was just like, I'm not, I'm just not into this stuff. Even when I was in medical school and, and doing my residency, when I was working 120, 130 hours a week and, you know, all kind of brain dead zombie, I just never got into coffee, but yeah, morning routine. Usually, um, uh, I get up relatively early now. I mean, I just wake up spontaneously, five o'clock, something like that. I just pop open and and I'm ready to go. I'm well rested. I mean, the nice thing about my sleep now is it's just so restoring that I that I just feel great. And I get up and I usually I do a little bit of exercise. Like usually I jump in and knock out a hundred push-ups or something like that. Hop in the shower. Uh, if the dogs are awake, I'll take them for a walk, feed the animals. You know, feed my dogs. I got some fish and some some koi in a koi pond, so I feed everybody. Um, Usually I'm doing some, a little bit of work in the morning that I feed myself and then I kind of just, you know, get on with the day depending on what I've got scheduled. So, I mean, that, that's the morning routine, not very complicated. Um, 
just, uh, you know, it's, and usually, like I said, I tend to eat breakfast, as mo- breakfast most mornings just because I'm hungry when I wake up. Cause I, I just, you know, by the t- you know, like I had dinner at six o'clock last night or five thirty last night. And it's, you know, it's where we were 13 hours later. My, I'm, I'm starting to say, I'm starting to get a little hungry. So I could throw a couple of steaks on and, uh, have those cooked up and have them for breakfast. And, and so that's, you know, that's kind of my morning routine for the most part. And what is your typical day of eating like, and has it changed much from when you first started doing carnivore? It's been how many years for you now? A few years? Um, I am, I'm about to enter my start my fourth year. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, three years completed and then I'll be, be starting that fourth year in there, but not really, it hasn't changed much. I mean, I, I've gone through little phases where I'll throw in, you know, a little like a little more eggs and some, some seafood and a little bit of dairy, but I mean, gosh, red, red meat has been the staple for me since I started. I mean, it just, it just makes me feel really good. And, and right, right now I'm getting ready. I'm training for, I've got, so I'm going to Paris to compete in the world championships and rowing again. I won it last year because when I was here in California, so I'm going to go back there and try to defend my title. And for me, I just feel better on red meat. So currently right now I'm just on strict red meat and water and I, that's mm-hmm. all I'm eating and it's all I'll eat till, I, till then because it just makes my body not hurt. It makes me feel good. I'm energized well. And, you know, sometimes like, you know, when I'm just kind of regular, I might throw some eggs and some salmon, a little bit of dairy. And then and with those things, I don't feel quite as good. I mean, but you know, it gives me a little more variety, uh, which, you know, I, I think that's fine too. But I honestly, and again, I, I, I just have to be honest about what's happening to me physically, objectively. And, and, and for me, it's, it's just red meat and water and, you know, fattier cuts of red meat obviously are a little more satisfying and they taste a little better to me. Uh, So yeah, my, my, it remains the same. I don't, I haven't seen a need need to change so far. My health continues to do well. I continue to, you know, even at, even three years in, I'm still getting faster and stronger, you know, on on, on the sport I'm competing at. So it's really nice to see that it's continuing to work and, you know, I'll I'll be 53 and uh, uh, here in a couple of weeks or not a couple of weeks, January 10th. So we're, we're about Six weeks out, i would be 53, and man, I feel great. Now, I know for a little while you were doing a little bit of experimenting with leaner steak, and you were also doing some fasting in there. How did that turn out for you, and do you still practice any of that? Yeah, so I mean, as far as fasting, I've never been, and, and I think there certainly can be some, some benefit to fasting. I think for certain people in certain situations, it, it can be helpful. For me, I, I don't. I've never been a, you know, set the clock, you know, eating window, I, you know, faster. I've never sat there and said, I'm only going to eat between these hours and I'm going to wait for 24 hours before my next meal. It's not very intuitive to me. Um, I did, you know, I had uh, Cole Robinson on our podcast and he was talking about his snake diet and people doing the extended fast. So I did a, I did a 48 hour fast and, you know, it's kind of funny because I was like, well, I'm going to eat all the food I need to eat for two days in one sitting and then I'm going to fast for 48 hours. And for me, that was eight pounds of food. So I ate eight pounds of food in one sitting and I was pretty miserable. I was like, Oh, laying on the couch and I just couldn't move for like three of that. I mean, that's, that was like stuffed for me. And yeah. I don't I didn't enjoy that. It was like, but I just did an experiment. So um, I eat very infrequently. It's twice a day. I mean, that's, you know, sometimes once a day. So I, I don't, you know, I, 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 I spend a lot of time not eating and, and technically fasting. I'm not like consciously saying I've got to fast. Uh, as far as the, the leaner cuts go, um, for me, you know, right now I am at a happy weight, good body composition. Um, I feel good. I eat to I eat to my content. I'm eat to my satiety, um, and that works great for me. If I want to get really, really lean, and you know, that's mostly for vanity reasons, like hey, look, I got a six pack or something like that, right? If I want to do that. For me, and I think for most people that are in my situation, eating leaner meat is going to do it. I mean, it, th- this is where you get into normal, and I call them wild type humans versus, you know, bodybuilders, fitness models, which aren't normal humans. I mean, it's it's not human physiology to walk around at six or seven percent body fat, you know, for a guy, or you know, thirteen percent body fat for a girl. That's not normal. That's just not normal. And to right. do that you've got to do abnormal things with your physiology, with your diet. And, you know, when you talk to most people, when they get there, they're like, man, this sucks. I don't like being, you know, super, super lean because I feel bad. My hormones are shot. My sleep is bad. I'm irritable. I'm grumpy. Um, so on and so forth. I will say that the people that do do this, 
that our fitness competitors and bikini models that I've talked to say when they do it from with a carnivore style approach, they don't lose their menstrual cycle. It's the easiest they feel. I mean, it's still not great, but it's, it's so much better than the other alternatives. And so, um, you know, I, I, you know, like every once in a while I'll do it just for the heck of it. I, you know, I'm, I'm like, sometimes I get a little like, you know, I want to be a little leaner for, for whatever reason. My, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of schizophrenic with my goals. Sometimes I want to be strong. Sometimes I want to be lean, you know, sometimes I'm competing. And so it just, it just fluctuates a little bit, but for me and most people, I would say leaner cuts seem to work. I mean, there's some people where higher fat produces more satiety and they end up eating a little bit less and they can lose some weight that way. But I think that gets you into the normal human physiology shape you know if we look at hunter gatherers they're not bodybuilders they're not fitness competitors they are you know lean relatively lean you know not obese people functional people and i think that's that is probably the healthy normal human human position i don't think walking around at six percent body fat is going to confer you any increased longevity or health protection i think you know once you get down to this you know, whatever normal percentage, you're probably, probably fine with that. Yeah. And I'm sure the body likes to have a little bit of extra reserves on it, you know, just for. Yeah. I mean, we are the fattest primate. And the reason for that (laughs) is because of our big, big fat brain. I mean, and you know, our brain needs to have energy and, you know, some people are, you can fuel it with glucose, but if glucose is not available, and I mean, dietary glucose, you can obviously make it through gluconeogenesis, as you yes. well know. Um, you know, you, you have to have some reserve there. And so that's why we, we fight to lose those last few ounces or pounds or ounces of fat because our body says, you know, we need, we've got a very energy hungry brain. And so we need to have some body fat on us. Yeah. Now I'm curious, have you, do you ever differentiate between do you feel in yourself when you, cause you're probably in more, I would think a more glycolytic on the kind of between the glycolytic ketogenic mode, uh, based on how much meat you eat. Do you notice a difference if you are more in ketogenesis or more in that glycolytic state? Cause you're making all your own glucose via gluconeogenesis. It's a much cleaner kind of form of it. Do you notice any difference there? Well, I, you know, like I said, you, you, when you make your own glucose, and this is a, this is the third of thing that people sort of say, well, you got to have glucose to, for your, to fuel your brain. Obviously, you, yes, that's true, but or you need it for certain certain uh, structures in your body, the organs that use that. Yeah, you make it your own, and it's very well regulated. And I think that's the thing. I mean, it's you know, as you know, it's pretty much demand driven, assuming you have enough supply. Um, and, and so it, it you know. I find myself very steady with that. Now, if I, I don't, I, you know, like I said, we talked about before, I still don't check my ketones. I don't really <laughs> care. I mean, I've never been someone that said, I got to pee on a strip or breathe in the thing or take yeah. blood. To me, I'm not, I'm not that into that, but um, I can tell probably when I haven't, uh, you know, there's a difference for me when I'm eating more fat relative to leaner. And I think there's a difference for me when I may be eating less frequently. And I think training plays a big impact on that for me. If I'm not training, um, I probably feel a little better with, with, with more fat and probably more, yeah. more ketone ish, you know, it would be my guess. Um, but at the same time, I like to train hard. I mean, that's just me. I'm just, I'm just kind of, I'm just a competitive guy. I like having muscle. I mean, muscle I think is so important. Yeah. I like training to put it on. And so I think there's a, there's a, there's a nice mix in there. And, and, uh, um, so, I mean, there's a little difference, but I mean, I generally feel pretty good. I, I generally feel pretty good all the time, quite honestly. No, you're absolutely right about how much the body regulates it. Because I know for me being zero carb, I just have my body wakes up at the same number every single day, same blood glucose number. I'm not even like one difference. It just likes where it's at and it keeps it there and it's kind of steady there all the time, which is really, really interesting. Now, what do you make of all the talk between the fat and protein ratios and certain approaches like, you know, the PKD, which is more of a two to one fat to protein? What are your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. So I had, I did a live stream with Trophia Clemens the other day and we talked about oh, that. Nice. And, I, and I said, you know, I said, I said, you know, I said, you know, you, you recommend a two, two to one 
for PKD, and that's about, you know, when you calculate the number, it's a little over 80% of your calories coming from fat. And I said, why not? Why not 75%? You know, what is, what is the magic number? And she said to me, well, honestly, there's no magic number. We just want to see X amount of ketones and a, and a ketone glucose mm-hmm. index. And so you might be in that range at 70%. You know, it just depends. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people on higher protein. I mean, you've seen that where they'll, they'll eat a bunch of protein and yet they're still producing a lot of ketones or, or yet their glucose is still super low. And so you know, if, if your sort of PKD philosophy is, you know, we want, we want a glucose ketone index to be X, then that's the goal. Not, we have to have 80% of our calories coming from fat. So it may vary from person to person. And again, I think it does vary from the demands of the person who they are. I think athletes, quite honestly, probably do better with more protein. I mean, that's my view as an athlete that is, you know, like, like I said, I think there are certain people that are going to do better with fat. And I think you just have to figure that out yourself, unfortunately. I mean, not unfortunately. I mean, I think it's just, it's just what you have to do. I mean, that's yeah. at the end of the day, what I'm talking about is you've got to figure out what's going to work for best for you. You've got to be objective. You've got to determine what your goals are. Um, and so regardless, I think people on a carnivore diet are eating more fat than the average person. And they're also eating more protein than the average person. I think both of those facts generally, you know, can be a good thing. Now, I want to ask you about protein turnover, because I think this is something that we don't really talk about that often. And I was just giving a presentation on autophagy, and I was researching different protein turnover numbers. So uh, my sports nutrition, nutritionist program, they estimated protein turnover was about 300 to 14 grams per day. Yoshinori Osumi, who just got the Nobel Prize on autophagy, he said, it's about 200 to 300 grams per day. And every two to three months, all the protein in our body is turned over. And uh, Don Lehman, I was asking him, and he said around 250 to 300 grams. So we know that this protein recycling and turnover is happening in our cells every day. And we're getting a lot of that protein from that protein turnover. Based on that, do you think that there's a minimum that people need to get of protein per day, or do you think, so I had a really interesting question during my talk. Someone said, hey, based on all that protein turnover that's happening, could someone technically survive off of just amino acids if your body is recycling protein on its own? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, we have to remember that the research that we're talking about is, is going to be done in omnivorous people eating mostly a high carbohydrate diet. So that's where that data is coming from. So, so you have to first put that, that, that's the first thing I say. So we don't know, maybe in a carnivorous diet, it's up or it's down. So, um, and, and to your point about, you know, every three months your body recycles, that, that's, that's probably pretty accurate. Um, you know, we know that, you know, one to 2% of our muscle mass is being turned over every day and our muscle is primarily protein. And so when we look at you, you know, uh, RDA recommendations for protein, they're abysmally low. I mean, they are the minimum to prevent basically sarcopenia and, and, you know, failing health. And so that 0.8 per kilogram is really low. And and guys like Lehman and Stu Phillips and other guys, they're going to recommend, you know, 1.6 to 2.2 grams per day, which is about a pound, a pound per pound per, you know, a gram per pound of body weight. And so um, whether that's to, to compensate for this protein recycling, it probably has something significant amount to do with that. I don't doubt that. Um, can you survive on just amino acids? I would be, you know, like if that's the only thing you took in. I would be, I would say that's probably doubtful because first of all, we have essential amino, I'm sorry, essential fatty acids. So right you got to get those. And so you can't just live on only amino acids. Now for a period of time, you can go eat lean meat, chicken breast. You can do, you know, protein sparing modified fast. You can do that for a while. Uh, But after a period of time, you know, we hear talk about rabbit starvation, you know, part of that has to do with a hypercaloric situation anyway, because um, rabbit starvation. Yeah. If you're eating rabbits, you're you're not eating much food anyway. Rabbits are pretty puny. You're not getting much meat on them. Anyway, so you're probably just in in a very hypercaloric state in addition to being on a, on a low fat state, but I don't think you could survive on just amino acids for a prolonged period of time. I just, I mean, I think you'd, you'd become depleted of a number of things, particularly right. some of the fats and the, the fat soluble vitamins and yes. some of the, some of the minerals as well. And so 
no. <laughs> yeah, no. that was pretty much the answer that I gave. I was just curious on your take on it because it was kind of an interesting question. Um, have you ever tried much raw meat? And what do you think about carnivores who kind of prioritize raw meat? I personally love beef tartare and I'm really spoiled because you know, Prague is very similar to Paris with a lot of Parisian food. They have beef tartare everywhere. And I absolutely love it. But I also love cooked steak. But I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah. So raw meat has been eaten all over the world for as long as humans have been alive. Um, raw meat is, uh, you know, for, for many people, they, they really enjoy it. Um, there is a risk of contamination. It does occur. It's not none. I mean, I think certain people are more susceptible, you know, as we know, uh, humans evolve with a very extremely low gastric pH of 1.5. We're among the lowest of all the animal kingdom on par with vultures and hyenas and other scavenging animals. So that was our defense mechanism to prevent, you know, poisoning or, or infection from, from parasites and other bacterial infections from eating raw meat. So we did that for a long period of time. Having said that, we started cooking meat you know, and, and, you know, some people are saying now, even far as back as a couple, two million years ago, 1.5 million years ago, guys like Bill Schindler, anthropologist saying that Homo erectus very likely could have contained and controlled fire and probably was cooking that far along. So we are well adapted to cook meat as well. I think that's a, that's a, that's a very long, very long thing. And you think about it, it's just physically, it's, it's appealing. It tastes appealing. And I think those things are, uh, you know, things to think that maybe may we, we can, we should be eating those things. Um, do you the, think there would be more iron in it? More iron in what? Raw like meat? Raw versus cooked? Um, yeah, probably to some some degree, but I don't think it's hugely significant. I don't think you're going to become iron deficient because you oh, eat no. cooked meat. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's it's just not likely to happen. Um, I think that uh, the sort of the people that are saying the only thing you can eat is raw meat, and, and if you don't, you're you're stupid. I think that's just silly. I mean, I think there's there's no there's no evidence that I have seen, you know, basically, and I've, and I've probably seen more carnivores than anybody and surveyed more of them. And the majority of them are eating cooked meat and doing just fine. They're doing so much better than everybody else on the standard American diet. I mean, it's just, it's just silly to say, you, you know, you can only eat raw meat. I've done raw meat. I did. I went a week eating nothing but raw meat and I didn't enjoy it as much. I mean, I don't want to sit there and gnaw on a raw steak. I mean, there's some people that like that, but for me, it's just not, that appealing. And I mean, I think what happens is you don't eat as much eating raw yeah. meat, probably because it's just not appetizing. And I mean, it's not as appetizing to me. And I've had some steak tartare and I, and I, I, I actually prefer like beef carpaccio. I mean, I think that's yeah. great that I prefer that over steak tartare. Um, obviously, you know, I was eating sushi years ago and, and that's fine too. So I don't really have a problem with people eating raw meat. I, I mean, I just say, make sure it's sourced well and you know, be careful with contamination, particularly if you're compromised with your immune system, your gastric acid pH. You know, older people tend to have lower gastric, or sorry, higher gastric pH, uh, which means which means less acidity. So there are there are you know, for the most part, and I and I I discuss this in the book too. I talk about you know the the potential benefits of raw meat versus not, uh, and and some of the, the 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 pros and cons. So yeah, I address that. I find it very very filling, and I thought maybe it had to do with. Um, some of the nutrients in it being more bioavailable, but then there's arguments on both sides of that. So that's kind of interesting. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you about addictions and carnivore, because one thing that I've seen, I come from a food addiction background. I've seen so many people in the carnivore space find that once they go more and more carnivore and more and more meat-based, that their addictions seem to be much easier to deal with. And I think this is really amazing. I've been trying to do as much research on it as I can. And I, I think my working theory is that it helps replenish our dopamine levels and tyrosine, and that helps kind of the levels in the brain level out so that people are no longer, they're more satisfied from what they're eating, their dopamine levels are better regulated, and so they're less susceptible to addictive behaviors. I'd love to know your opinion on that because I'm sure you've seen so many stories and testimonials and things, you know, you get them by the dozen every day. So love to know what you think about that. 
Yeah, I mean, that is a very fascinating topic. And what I've, what I've discussed, and, and, you know, I had, uh, I think I did a podcast with Dr. Chris Palmer out of Harvard. He's a psychiatrist who's using, you know, ketogenic and, and somewhat carnivore diets to help with, you know, his patients that have uh, mental health disorders. But addiction, um, you know, certainly food addiction is, I think, a real thing. There's people that disagree with that. But clearly, there are people that really, their behavior is driven by food. And one of the things with a carnivore diet and I think it's unique to a carnivore diet is it really, really help. I mean, it's the only cold Turkey way to get off sugar and some of the carbohydrates that many people are addicted to. I mean, it's probably the most effective way. And that's, that makes sense to me. But what I'm also seeing is people give up smoking, drinking alcohol, you know, sometimes it's illicit drugs. Uh, sometimes it's things like coffee and stuff like that. Um, and that is happening. And just like you said, they say, I just don't desire it anymore. And yeah. I think there's, uh, it, it may be, you know, it may be something with the dopaminergic system. It's, 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 there's a lot of things going on. I think, you know, when we're on a glucose based diet, you know, we have glucose, you know, as you know, they're up and down, up and down. And it's kind of, our brain is being affected by that. And I think there's this sort of need for a constant stimulation to feel right, you know, because our, we, we're trying to, we're always trying to constantly make our physiology be at the right level. And it's, and it's usually up and down and then you hit a sweet spot for a bit. And then it's either too high or too low. And I think with uh, a diet that is more meat and fat based, you're, you're always kind of, or you seem to be always at that, that, that proper level. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it may be just getting enough of the right nutrition and it may be, I'm sure there's more things there. I'm sure we, we don't know for sure. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it does seem to work and it seems to work very well. And uh, I haven't looked into all of the possible physiologic mechanisms. I know, you know, there's a lot of behaviors, anxiety, and there's, there's things where we see like supplementation with carnitine, creatine, uh, carnosine, taurine, uh, zinc levels, all of those things seem to help with mental health. And I think addiction probably it falls into there as well. Yeah. Now, one of the questions I get the most often is about sodium and electrolytes. And one thing that I, I get this question a lot from women, and I would love to know your take on it. But a lot of women say that, and these are carnivore women as well as keto, that when they add sodium to their foods, they end up with water retention. And there seems to be some kind of link there. And I've been researching, you know, the renal reabsorption of sodium and how less of it occurs when you're, you know, your insulin levels are lower. But I don't, I'm curious why and if you've seen that. And what do you personally do in terms of sodium supplementation? Well, I'll answer the first part because uh, it's easy because I can just tell you the answer. So, I mean, I, I salt to taste. I, I put a fair bit of salt on my steaks. And then when I, before I train, I often throw a little extra salt in some water. And I drink that for the reason of expanding my intravascular and inter intramuscular water. And that, that helps me with performance. And so I am, I am a guy that probably takes in more salt than the average American by, by probably quite a bit. And it, and it does well for me. Uh, as you pointed out that, you know, when you reduce your insulin and a carnivore diet is extremely low in, in its insulin production overall. I mean, there's a, there's a little spike you get when you eat, but for the most part, you're in a low insulin state. And then as you know, insulin will cause the kidney to reabsorb sodium. And when you don't have as much insulin, you're, you're, you're losing more sodium. And so I think part of that has to do with um, obviously what your diet is and then, and then also your activity. If you're, if you're doing a lot of sweating, there's probably some decent you know, reason to maybe re replace some of that. And that, that may be going on. Um, as far as why some people are um, retaining water, <clears throat> I think some of that may have to do with, you know, we have people that are salt sensitive with, with regards to hypertension, but typically those people um, are still sort of in, in the throes of metabolic syndrome. You know, and we see mm -hmm. that when you get the sugar out of the diet, when you fix that, that insulin dysregulation, then the, they seem to become less salt sensitive. I think there's some evidence there. And so I don't know, you know, maybe the women you're talking to are still in that sort of stage where they're still maybe, you know, metabolically deranged. And then that may be taking months and months and even some years to sort of correct themselves on that. So that would be my best guess on that. I think it's probably one of the most challenging topics because there are people that will, you know, have cramping and will have these, you know, sometimes the, the, the swelling and, 
you know, the, the symptoms and, and, and trying to regulate that's the hardest thing. There are people out there that will say that, you know, I'll have a little fructose and it helps me with, 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 with cramping and stuff like that. And that, if that works fine, I mean, like I said, at the end of the day, um, you've got to do what works. And right. I, I don't really, I, I'm just saying do what works for you. I mean, I, I don't, I don't need to do that. Have I ever had a cramp? Yeah, I've had some cramps from time to time, but I usually notice for me, it happens when I just don't eat enough. And, and sometimes because meat has electrolytes in it, you know, this is a thing most people don't understand. Meat is mostly water, but there is sodium, there's potassium, there's magnesium, there's cal calcium, there's all those uh, uh, electrolytes that are in meat actually. And people don't realize that, you know, your muscles are filled with electrolytes in order for them to function. They've got to have those electrolytes and your muscle doesn't contract without calcium. And so one of the things that people, you're not getting enough calcium on a, on a carnivore diet if you don't add dairy. Well, guess what? Calcium absorption rates go up significantly in the absence of carbohydrates, and they go up significantly in the, in the presence of protein. So, I mean, all these sort of assumptions we have about you're going to be low on that or deficient of that or theoretically on that doesn't seem to hold up when you actually look at human beings and, and you can look at all the compensatory uh, things our body has in these different states. And we can look at, you know, there's a lot of data on that going back to when they first started looking at population like the Inuit, you know, or when they used to call them the Eskimos back in the 20s and 30s. So it's interesting, interesting data out there. It is, and it's very, very interesting how the body seems to become more sensitive to certain things. Like we don't need as much thyroid circulating. Our bodies become more sensitive to that. And the same goes for, you know, glutathione. And it, it's amazing how the body just, regulates and becomes more sensitive and we don't need to panic when we see these levels going down because the body just doesn't seem to need as much um, in this form. Now, I'd love to ask you one last question about fasting and extended fasting. I just listened to a podcast with Rob Wolf and he was saying that he saw a study that was done where extended fasting and too much fasting had a very negative impact on the stem cell pool. And that there's, you know, our telomeres can only replicate so many times. Our telomere length shortens every time that replication takes place. So I'd love to know what your thoughts are on, you know, extended fasting. I know we touched on it a little bit before with, you know, Cole Robinson, the snake diet. Um, but uh, yeah, what, what do you think overall on that approach? I mean, clearly there are some people getting, getting, some benefits from extended fasting. and the people losing weight. I mean, it works for that. I mean, for, I, I, I just don't think you, not, you can deny that. I think if you're going to do extended fasting and then again, depending on how you define it, some people will say 48 plus hours up to like a month or something like that. Yeah. I think you better be doing resistance training. I mean, I think you, you, you need to, you know, you need to give your body a signal to hang on to muscle because um, you, you can potentially lose muscle doing that. I know, I know there's people who disagree with that, but I think you need to combine it with that. I think, you know, it's interesting, you know, maybe it does prevent, you know, telomere may, may compromise, you know, tel telomere like, um, that's one aspect, you know, every time we get into one study and we find one biochemical reaction, we're like, Oh my God, it's all bad. We don't know for sure. I mean, that, this is the whole point of this sort of thing. You've got to take the whole picture in, into account. And, you know, if, if for you, you're, you know, you're a hundred pounds overweight and getting that weight off you is going to be the best thing you can do. And maybe you lose a little muscle, maybe that's okay in your situation. Uh, so you have to, you have to kind of figure out where you are and where you need to go and what you're dealing with. For me, extending fasting, I have no desire to do that. I, I just don't, I mean, I don't think it would benefit me quite honestly. I mean, there's, there's no yeah. real reason for me to do that. I mean, I'm already intermittent fasting more or less anyway, so I don't know that, that, that I'm going to see a tremendous benefit from that. You know, I haven't read the study on the telomer stuff, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. And, and I'm sorry, you know, like, but I, but like I said, anytime I learn about some new biochemical, you know, new, new G whiz type of thing, I'm like, okay, that's one of 50 billion reactions that are happening in our body. Is that the one, you know? Right. And, and so I am always, I, I'm just a big picture guy. I'm just like, what are we trying to measure? What is the end point? What is important to me clinically? What are my inputs? What is, what is the result? And, you know, there, like I said, you can, you can, you can look at all these biochemical reactions and, and make a really compelling argument anyway. And you can scare people and you can, you can make people think this is the best thing. And, and what it often does is it drives people to buy supplements. Hey, I can, I can, I can take some NAD and now I'm magically going to be better. None of that ever seems to work, you know, with any real significant change that I've ever seen. And I'm just, I'm kind of very skeptical about all this stuff, quite honestly. 
Well, carbohydrate restriction itself is a fasting mimetic. Is what I always talk about is if you're restricting all the carbs, you're already activating AMPK, you're, you know, suppressing mTOR, you are getting so many of the same benefits of extended fasting. Anyway, now what is your go to restaurant order when you are eating out? <laughs> Um, I generally, you know, like I said, I probably cook my own meals for 98% of what I eat. Um, I mean, you know, sad as it is, well, I don't think it's sad. I mean, more when I'm traveling often, I mean, I'm just, I'll just stop by a, a hamburger place, and get a hamburger patty. But if I go out to a restaurant nine times out of 10, if I'm the one that gets to pick the restaurant, I'm, I'm at a Brazilian steakhouse. And I'm I was going to say, <laughs> because I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, otherwise I'm spending 200, 200 bucks to get full, you know, and, and it's just yeah. doesn't make sense. And so uh, I just go in there and that's, that's what I do when I go to a restaurant. Typically, like when I go to these conferences and I, and I, you know, and I'm speaking most of the time, the whole gang goes out to, you know, yes. one of these Brazilian places and we just load up. And so that, that for me, is the thing and you know my my girlfriend is 98 percent carnivore now and she's awesome. like yeah she, she prefers to stay home and eat too because she's like man it, it's it's cheaper it's the foods that you can I, you can get the food like i like it i don't have to worry about stuff but when we go out she's she's fine we'll go to a barbecue place or a uh, brazilian steakhouse and and that's that works well those seems to be the only places that don't curtail the meat into the smallest possible portion what I love about those places too, it's one of the first places I tried chicken hearts and uh, they do that a lot like on the, at the Brazilian steakhouses. Now I know you don't really put too much into the nose to tail thing, but are there any organ meats that you ever eat uh, just for yourself personally? Um, so, I mean, let me, let me just say, I am not at all opposed to nose to tail. I think that's fine. I think it is something that um, can benefit a lot of people. My, not my opposition, but my, my sort of caution is to tell people that's the only way you can thrive and I don't, you know, or be optimal. I don't, I disagree with that. I think you can be optimal just eating what you see behind me. I think there's too many people that have demonstrated that. I demonstrate that every day with what I do. Um, I, I just, I think the sort of belief that you've got to eat organ meats because that's how all these indigenous tribes did it. I think when we look at current indigenous tribes, these people are, are subsistence hunters hunters they are living on the fringes of society they are in the worst places that we've driven them to they are scrapped for calories and so they eat every damn thing they can get organ meats don't preserve well i mean you kill a big wild mammoth fifty thousand years ago you can't preserve the organs very well i mean there's some people well, you can use a food dehydrator and make liver jerky but that that really we know that organs don't last very long. So it's not like we would, we would have had a plan. We, we certainly do, would not have had the ratios of organ meats that some people are advocating today. A cow is mostly muscle meat. It's like, you know, the liver for a cow weighs like 10, 15 pounds. You get 500 pounds of, of muscle meat on a cow or something close to that, depending on the size of the cow, maybe 400 pounds. So the percentage were, were obviously much smaller. And again, the liver doesn't preserve very well. And so, um, but... But having said that, I think there are definitely certain people that will benefit from doing that. And they will say, when I added this, it, it seemed to help me for a while. I will also tell you that the majority of the people that are doing that now in a year won't still be doing that because this is what happens. They go through a phase. They think they're doing the right thing. They're eating all these organs. And then a year later, like, eh, I didn't really notice a difference. So anyway, and I talk about, again, I talk about that in the book as well. I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with doing it. I think being uh, environmentally responsible, eating as much as the animal as you, you, you desire makes sense. I mean, there's, you know, we can go around the, the whole regenerative agriculture thing. And I think I'm a big, big proponent of that. That's what this shirt is about. Um, yeah. So I definitely wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we've got this push that we're going to save the planet by becoming vegetarians or vegans. That is not going to do it. That can't do it. You know, we end up just, we've got to restore our soil. I mean, that's just, just as much a part of this equation as not, it's not being talked about. The only way to do that is by properly managed ruminant animals. And we know that from guys like Alan Savory, Gabe Brown, you know, Will Harris, you know, and on and on and on, that they are demonstrating clearly that they can not only restore the soil, but they can increase the productivity of the land and they can put more animals on the land than they could before, which means you can put, you can produce more meat than previously thought. The naysayers, you know, the two studies that have come out saying you can't do regenerative agriculture and, 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 and 
feed the people at our current rate are not accounting for the fact that we're seeing increased productivity. And so they are discounting that fact, which is, uh, you know, just not, not, not accurate. So, um, and you know, the, the people who wrote the study, one was a, a Harvard guy that has no, 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 no knowledge of range science. And the other one was a guy who gets funding from Loma Linda, which as you know, is the Seventh-day Adventist group. And, and so we can do regenerative agriculture. We can make it work. We can restore our soils. We can feed, lots of people that way. And so I think we have to do that. That's awesome. Now I want to talk about your book. I want to talk about what people can expect from the book. And I bet you have an awesome steak preparation method, steak recipe, seeing as how many you cook. I love seeing you grilling with your, is it the auto grill? Yeah. Auto wild grill is from Germany. Yeah, you, 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 I mean, if you got a place to cook outside, it's, it's tremendous. It really works. Uh, it goes up to 1500 degrees. I've gotten spoiled now. I don't like cooking, eating steaks at all. <laughs> so, um, I think I got yeah. to find one of those. Yeah, I got a smoker, so I'm going to be smoking some brisket. Awesome. Yeah, that's going to be wonderful. Brisket is wonderful. But if you want, if you want the best way to make steaks that I have found is that grill. I mean, you know, like I said, it, it's, it's just it's really cool. Um, the book. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, one, I, the target audience I wrote it to were the general population, because I was, I, I, I want to expand this to the general population. So some of the carnivores will already know some of this information. It's not like, gee whiz, here's some scientific fact that you didn't know. There's some of that in there, that, but, but I mean, it's generally focused on getting the message out. You know, it, it is written in, um, I think uh, most people read it, say they can't put it down. They really enjoy it. They find it a little bit humorous, but very inspiring, very common sense, very thought provoking. Um, you know, I mean, the layout of the book is, you know, here's my story. And, and I didn't even put that in the, the, the editor and the publisher maybe put it in. I, I know. They like, want, <laughs> yeah. Right. So they're like, we want your story. So I wrote it and, and, and people have enjoyed that. And then we talk about historical evolutionary, you know, the, 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 the biochemistry, the, 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 the philosophy time, why meat is good for us. What, why, what's so great about meat? What may be problematic about plants? We get into, um, you know, obviously some of the success stories, because I think that's an important part of this this whole thing is sharing some success stories. So we've got some great success stories in there. I wrote a couple of composite ones, which were kind of, you know, I included real life people. Then I wrote a composite, some composite ones of, you know, this is, this is what I see. And this is a generic guy. And then I get into the nuts and bolts of how do you start the diet? What are the, what, you know, what works? What are the, what, what are there different ways you can do it for different, different reasons? Um, what are the problems you may run into? How to deal with those? You know, what are the misconceptions around eating meat? Is it going to give you cancer? Is it going to give you heart disease? What about cholesterol? All those things are in there. I talk about, um, you know, how to use it as an athlete, how to, how to use it as, uh, you know, how to transition away from it, because I think that's important too. I think, you know, how do you reintroduce? Because a lot of people will use this as a tool to solve issues and get them to get them to a place where they're like, man, I finally, and I talk a lot about this kind of the, uh, a lot of the psychology behind this, because I think it's important. One of the things, and you know, we've got this website called meetrx.com and it's a training coaching program and it's a community and it's a lot more than that. But when I talk to the coaches, I say, look, the number one thing you have to accomplish with your clients is have them change their relationship with food. I think that has to be, that has to occur uh, for anything to be successful long term, they have to do that. And I talk about that in the book and, and you know, get into the philosophy. And, and, you know, I just and then I have a chapter on veganism, why veganism is not the answer. And I kind of kind of debunk a lot of their their stuff. I mean, it's, it's I could have gone a lot more in detail, but I just kind of it's, it's kind of touched over. And then there's a, a lot of resources in the book. I do talk about cooking methods. Um, and then I have an epilogue, which I just kind of talk about, look, this is an important discussion and we need to really do this. And we're, we're our, our food sovereignty is under attack. We are, yeah. we are headed to a situation where all the food will be centrally controlled. We won't have a lot of choice in what we're eating and it will be processed and it'll be vitamin fortified human pet food. And this is what we're heading to. And we've got to, we've got to, as a community, stand up to that and, and, and yeah. do whatever it takes to, to prevent that. Because if not, you know, not for me, I'm not going to be, I'm, I'm going to probably be, you know, for the rest of my life eating nutritious food if, if, because I know better, but our kids are being indoctrinated. Our next generation is being sort of, you know, brought forward to this. Yeah. Don't worry about it. You can just take a pill. You can just take a supplement. Yeah. 
Don't worry about the poor quality of the food. Don't worry about the nutrition. Oh, that upset stomach. Yeah, that's normal. You know, your, your, your anxiety, hey, it's a tough world. There's a lot of stuff going on. That's normal. Um, and so we have to, you know, we, we can't let this just happen. I mean, you know, I, I, I can't. I mean, you know, if you're going to be passive, quality of life's going to go down. And, and I, I hate to see that. I hate to see it for my children. That's one of the reasons why, why I'm here doing this. Yeah, well, I'm so glad that they made you put in that part about yourself because I think it's it's really important and people definitely really love you and the work that you're doing and want to know more about your story and everything that has made you into the leader and the man that you are today. You know, you're a hero. Like, you are standing up and fighting against all this crap and it's you're the perfect person that we needed, you know, to be able to take this on and... Um, I'm so thankful. I know so many people are thankful for all the week work that you're doing. It, it is making a difference. Like you are seeing these headlines come out. You're seeing more and more of this happen. And I love knowing that you're connecting with all these other people in the space and doing these studies and work. Uh, and that ma man you mentioned behind the evidence base, um, you know, study, because that's what we need and be able to, they need to see the New York Times and they need to see those publications, put that stuff in there before they will really pay attention to it. So I had a couple of quick questions that I got on Instagram and I'd be remiss if we didn't get to them. So um, one question I thought was interesting here that came in. Um, it was about uh, reintroductions. We got actually got a lot of questions. I'll just pick um, the first few that, that okay. came in here and um okay it was oh aunt zudis said why am i having horrible effects when i try to reintroduce foods yeah i mean well i think what what clearly happens is your so when you switch onto a carnivore diet you upregulate certain enzymes and metabolic processes that were relatively down regular you may be producing more acids and more you you know, your, your lipase goes up, your, your proteases go up, your body, you know, kind of shifts. It makes a shift. So shifting back can be a bit of a problem. There's obviously a mi microbiome has changed. Um, it depends on what food you're eating. You know, if you're trying to put, you know, seed oil back in the diet or processed food, hey, maybe maybe you shouldn't be eating that stuff in the first place. If you're trying to put in some kind of whole, wholesome, I don't know, I can't say wholesome, but um, if you're trying to eat some food that maybe is really high in fiber, that fiber can be an irritant for a lot of people. I mean, we have to build up a tolerance to it. And so it may take a while to build up tolerance to that stuff. Um, it, you may have to do small amounts, you know, at a time. I, I, I would, and I talk about this in the book again, how to, how to reintroduce foods. Right. Um, but a lot of it has to do with, with small amounts, um, seeing how you react, uh, realizing the gastrointestinal reaction may not be you may adapt to that. And so you can readapt to it. Now, if you're, if you, if you put in, you know, you, you, you try to add spinach back in the diet and all, oh, oh my gosh, you're starting to get joint pain again. That may be a problem. You know, maybe the oxalates in the spinach are problematic and you may not, may not just want to, may not do that. Try another, another food, but don't try to reintroduce a multi-ingredient food. You know, if you're having, you know, if you're eating, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, food that's been put together with 20 ingredients, I don't know which one's causing a problem for you. So you have to go single ingredient, I think, when you yes. reintroduce. Yeah, and slowly, one at a time, you know, a slice and then a little bit more a few days later can really help. Uh, Jennifer Herna says, any suggestions on feeling cold while in ketosis? I am heavy meat keto transitioning to carnivore. Feeling cold, um, you know, obviously a thyroid is an issue for people. I mean, I would look at thyroid, make sure you're not, you're not hypothyroid. Um, it might just be you're not eating enough. I mean, that's 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 a, that's probably the most common reason for that. So I would just look at maybe considering upping your your food 10, 20 percent, or maybe perhaps maybe a little more fat. You know, um, those are two options I'd look at for that. Uh, Hell, Betty, eighty-eight. I went carnivore and started to develop a keto rash, but I love this way of eating. Any tips? Yeah, so I, I, there's a couple things that uh, potentially produce rash. One are ketones. If you're if you're in ketosis and you're wasting a lot of ketones, uh, some of it can come out the skin. It can be irritating. Oxalates are another potential cause of rashes, and so we know if you've been on a 
high oxalate diet and often a ketogenic diet can be if you're eating a lot of leafy greens and dark chocolate and almond products um, and you and you, then you stop, uh, you can have oxalates that shift out of uh, crystals and then they go into solute because of the diffusion gradient and then they re, re, reaccumulate somewhere else and sometimes they can be excreted to the skin. Sally Norton has done a lot of yeah. work with regard to that. And then you know, I look at your dairy intake. Some people, it's dairy. I mean, dairy, if you're eating a lot of dairy on a, on a keto or a carnivore diet, dairy can be uh, problematic for skin. So those are the most three common rash producing things that I see. That's interesting. Yeah, I I do better without dairy. I know I've seen some people say like having some low starch berries can help just slow down the, the rash reaction. Um, Abby Zach says, uh, I really want to start carnivore, but I'm nervous. I'll start wrong. What would my first day look like first week? Do I ease in and have dairy, heavy cream, butter? How much meat should I cook to start? It's a great question. Yeah, and again, that's something I, I go over pretty pretty well in my book. But I think some people, you know, particularly people that are already fat adapted, can jump right in. In many cases, um, I do think like transition issues. You, you know, if you transition away from a carb heavy diet, that may you may do better with a slower transition. The way I, you know, well, and I'll talk about this. And, and so, fiber can carbs can be an issue. Transitioning away from a lot of fiber to no fiber can be an issue. And then uh, we talked about this a little bit. Oxalates can be a it can be a concern. The way I did it personally, I did a couple of days here and there. I did I went one or two days carnivore, steak and eggs for me, um, and then you know, then then I then I went three or four days, and then I went a week, and then I went two weeks, and then I went thirty days. That is one way to do it. Like I said, I've got a, I've got a kind of an outline, rough six week intro into carnivore for people oh, that want to transition. Um, so you can look at that, and it kind of tells you this is kind of a suggested percentage of your meals that should be carnivore. Um, you know, if you go full carnivore um, right away, you, you, the biggest thing you have to do is, is make sure you're eating enough because that that can be problematic for a lot of people. And I tell people, don't worry about weight loss or weight gain or body composition for the early adapt adaptation period, just, just make sure you're getting enough. And, and we're going to, we're going to try to get you through the addiction process, make sure you're not lethargic and too fatigued from under eating. And so that can be a challenge for people. And so fatty, I think the baseline is fatty cuts of red meat is, is kind of the baseline food. And that would be things like ribeye and short ribs and skirt steak and brisket and, you know, flat iron steaks and stuff like that. That'll have a little bit higher fat content. Um, that can be a helpful place to start. You know, and some people don't do well with fat initially. And if, if you do, you may have to modify that. Or some people will find that using smaller amounts or some people add in lipases and bile salts and stuff like that as, 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 as transition tools. Aid. So it depends on where you're coming from. So without knowing more information, I can't tell you for yeah. sure. But go, go, you know, look in the look book. At the and book. You, look at the book. Look at yeah, the book. Right. Look book. Absolutely. Where yeah, can right. everyone get your book? And I'll put it in the show notes here for sure. But where can everyone find your book and the new website? Yeah, new, the book is out on Amazon. It's in Barnes and Nobles. It's way, it's, a, it's available worldwide. Uh, I think Book Depository has it. I know if you go to my Instagram, Sean Baker nineteen sixty seven. That's S H A W N B A K E R one nine six seven. Uh, it's in the link in my bio. Um, it's doing well on Amazon. They're getting really good reviews. Um, awesome. The website. Okay, perfect. And the, the website is, is called meetrx.com. So it's like meat prescription rx.com. Um, it is, we just, uh, we, we, we launched it. Uh, we're on our third day after we launched it. The first day we launched, we, we actually it broke our server. We had so many people going there. We've had, wow. uh, we've had, you know, coaches, we've already had some 50 some coaches already signed up to get certified. We've got lots of members joining. Um, we, we, I have a live community event every day, lots of live community events. I'm doing them every morning, doing Q and A's with the members, um, to answer their questions. We've got a huge research library of all this stuff that's continually growing and being curated, organized for you. We've got the largest library of success stories. We incorporated the entire Meat Heals site. In fact, if you go to Meat Heals right now, it'll redirect you to Meet Our X or Success Stories. Okay. We've added, we've, we've, we've added hundreds of stories to the Meet, Meet Our X collection, including some really great audio stories, which I think are wonderful. So you can hear the people talking. Um, we've got, uh, like I said, we've got the cheapest coaching possible. I mean, we, we, I mean, my goal is to make this affordable, bring it to the masses. Our coaches are great, but they're doing it because they love it. They're passionate about it. They would do it anyway for free. And so we're giving them, we're, we're paying them 
but we're still trying to keep it affordable for you guys. And so you can get a half hour of coaching for under 20 bucks, which I think is, wow, that's amazing. I mean, that is, you're not going to find a better price for that. And you're going to get, in my view, <laughs> the, the, the most, the, the, one of the most successful uh, interventions you can do for you, for your health. And so that, that's, that's there. And so we're, we're determined to make a huge difference in the world. And, and, you know, we, we've got a great team of volunteers and my co-founder, uh, Mazarostomy is just an incredibly bright, intelligent entrepreneur, uh, AI engineer, data scientist out of Silicon Valley. And so we are going to do some big things with this. And, I, and I, I'm really, really excited about this. That is so, so exciting. I can't wait to see what it turns into. Now, if you could put one thing on a billboard for the whole world to see, what would it say? <laughs> Goodness, that's a, that, I could put a lot of these things in there. I think... Um, well, I mean, a billboard slang has to be kind of catchy. I mean, this eat meat, save the planet is, is, is not a bad yeah. one, but, uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think a general thing is to, um, be your own advocate and, 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 and question everything. Yeah. Question at all. That's great. Well, Dr. Baker, thank you so much for taking your time. I took a lot of it this morning. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here with us again. It was really fun to get to do an update podcast and congratulations on your new book and on the new website. I'm really, really thrilled for you. And I thank you so much for all you're doing for the carnivore community. It really is incredible. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I appreciate the opportunity and good seeing you again. You too. All right. Bye for now.